Hello and welcome to the 27th episode of Concerts at Home. My name is Adrian Spence. I'm the Artistic Director for Camerata Pacifica. And let's uh, right away welcome Damari McGill to, uh, to Camerata Pacifica. Thanks for being part of this, Damari. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me, Adrian. It's good to see you. Yeah. So Damari is a flute player and he played with the Camerata in December last year. Was that right? Mm -hmm. offering, fantastic uh, mm -hmm. musical offering. And you were scheduled to play with us again this season, but we know what happened to that. Yes. Um, and a little background on you. Um, you've been principal flute in about 300 orchestras, is that right? Uh, yeah, you, I mean, rounding down, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's 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 for for such a, uh, a young man it's quite an illustrious list yeah <laughs> so, shall you name them or will i oh there's only a few um and who were what which of those including your acting positions my acting positions well currently i'm principal uh with the seattle symphony uh, prior to this, I was acting principal with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. And prior to that, I was principal flute of the Dallas Symphony. Uh, played two years as principal flute of the Seattle Symphony before that. Uh, some years with the San Diego Symphony. Um, let's see, I was acting principal of the Pittsburgh Symphony. And uh, my first job was with uh, the Florida Orchestra in the Tampa Bay area. I also was principal flute of the Santa Fe Opera Orchestra. It's a fabulous show that we have for you today because um, there's only one piece of camerata, there's only one camerata performance um, today. We've got new video, we get gifts from Damari and we've got gifts from Nick Daniel and the Leicester uh, International Music Festival. And so, and it gives us quite a bit to talk about. I've been, I've been thinking about this. So your, the, the video that you sent, you recorded, the, you recorded at the beginning of July. Yes. Jessica Cho. Yes. Um, to send to Jimmy Galway. Exactly, for his online summer festival. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, and uh, it's the four movement flute sonata by Reinecke. Yes. Of Undine. And so I decided to pair this with uh, another little piece performed by a bearded Northern Irish flute player. Um, that's all we need to say. And um, by Claude Debussy, the Syrinx. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and the reason I did that, I find this interesting. So. So give me a few minutes here and then, and then you can mm -hmm. see if you agree or disagree. So Syrinx, Syrinx is commonly th thought of as, as uh, the, the, the demigod Pan uh, fell in love with Syrinx and she disappeared and he ended up breaking reeds and, uh, and, and uh, performing this love song on, on the flute. This, 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 so you get this very nice white picket fence. Mm -hmm. And... And it's just not that at all. Syrinx was was uh, a nymph, and it's very portrayed as, as 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 these women are as very sensual and sexual. And Pan is half man and half goat, and he pursues um, Syrinx through the forest, and and she flees. And it's not that she's resisting his advances. She doesn't want to be ravaged and raped. Mm -hmm. And so she flees through the forest. She goes in, in and, and comes, comes across this pond and she asks her, her water and friends to help her. Mm -hmm. And they turn into a set of reeds. Um, and Pan comes charging into, in, into the, this, this, this area. She's lost and he sits down and, and, it, and his lust starts to subside. And, he tears the reeds and fashions a panpipe, plays this tune. But this is no great love song. This is this this is a highly sensual and and and, and the undertones in it are highly sexual. And a big undertone in that is violence. It's this is a 
violent mm. thing for such a beautiful piece of music. Then we come to the, Un, the Undin Sonata. Mm -hmm. And Undine is a water spirit. Mm -hmm. And she marries a mortal uh, to obtain a soul. And on her wedding night, when, when, when she's transformed and her, uh, uh, obtains his soul, her uncle, the most powerful water spirit in the land, appears to her. He's not happy with this. The water spirits don't, don't want her to stay married to this mortal. Mm -hmm. um, and he, and, 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 and uh, Huldebrand, this knight, her, her now husband is warned, don't, don't be angry to me, to Undine around water. And they live in this castle, and there are these specters and these ghosts and these frightening things appear. And Undine realizes this is the water spirits trying to trying to get in. And she she places a stone over the fountain. Mm -hmm. So it's a big long story. It's worth a read. Um, they have a fight on the Danube. They're in a boat on the Danube, and Hildebrand does indeed get angry at at Undine, and the water spirits come and take her back. Hildebrand marries somebody else, and on the night of their wedding, this uh, this new um, this new wife uh, mm -hmm. removes the stone of the fountain. Undine comes up through the fountain and kills Hildebrand with a kiss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I posit to you, my friend, mm -hmm. that these stories and mermaids and um the lorelei i think these stories you know we think of the fairy tales of, of, of grim and these stories i think indicate deep in the male psyche a fear of woman that's mm -hmm. what I, that's what i think these that these tales represent and i th and i think i think it's in there it's represented in there and this fear of women we're we're still living with today. Oh, I I believe so. Were you, were, I, I, were, I, you weren't I, anticipating this as an introduction to your lovely flute playing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's okay. I, I always in, enjoy my conversations with you, and um, it's that is not going to change today. <laughs> so um, I I think you're absolutely I think you're absolutely right. Um, you can look at the, the, the stories, not just of the, the two that you mentioned, but um, folklore um, and, and reality um, alike, the, from the past and the present. And if you are able to look with, with very um, open eyes, to the stories of the past and the present, yeah, I can see you can, it would be fairly easy to come to that conclusion. Yeah, I mean, it could, when, we, when we come to the present, it, 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 I, I think when, when you look at that fear, I think it's the seat of violence, domestic violence and rape and um, unequal pay. And, and and just the need to legislate or subjugate, just the inequality of the whole thing, you know. Yes, it's, it manifests itself as, uh, in every um, level of of existence. And it's yeah. in our folklore, and it's in our music. Yes. Uh, so, peop I mean, people people haven't changed. So, I'm reading. This, this, this is a fantastic book. I, I recommend to my, our friends out there. And I recommend you buy it through Chaucer's Bookstore in Santa Barbara, independent bookstore. The Great Leveler, Violence and the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century by Walter Scheidel. I, I saw it recommended by Fareed Zakaria and it is eye popping. It is not a light read. And basically it's talking about all the way to all the way back to when we, we be, became to the, the foundation of agrarian societies and, and when foodstuffs were able to be stored and surpluses gained and, and, and inheritance being able to pass things from, from one generation to the next, right 
back thousands and thousands of years ago, you started to see the separation between those who were able to hoard and and the one percent mm -hmm. and those who did not. So this is not a 20th century or a 19th century phenomenon. And it's fascinating. Hmm. And and I was thinking this part I did give you the heads up about because I come I come from a working class background in Northern Ireland. And somebody, my mum made me play the piano when I was seven because it was the aspirational middle class thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And from the start, I was, I was going to be a musician. And at nine, I had a flute stuck to my face. And I live a life now that I can't imagine. So I wonder, what's your background? So, do you, so, so how did you get started? Do you come from this wealthy... It's even harder to get started in the United States. All my lessons... I didn't pay for anything. I was given a flute. The state provided instrument and lessons. Yeah and learning so I could as a as a as a person with no money right I was able to break out of that economic strata how did you well do it's it it, it 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 took a variety of of fortunate circumstances to get me from that early the earliest point a to point let's say I'm at point m m or n now um you know, I definitely didn't come from a family with a lot of money. Um, my Both of my parents grew up in um, homes with not a lot of money at all. My father from the South and my mother grew up in, in Chicago. Um, so the fact even, I mean, it begins with them meeting each other where uh, they were they had the, the, the desire, the dedication to create a foundation, to create a home that would birth me and two classical musicians, okay? So it is kind of, it is kind of random, but um, they wanted us to be active. The one thing that their experiences taught them was what um, not to do, just from their experiences of observation alone. Um, we need to be very proactive in steering our children. What did your dad do? Uh, my dad, well, they both began as art teachers. They met in art school in college, and uh, they were, when I, up until I was four, they taught in the Chicago public school system, um, art. My father then actually joined the Chicago Fire Department when I was four, when my brother was born, and, and worked his way up. So there's just a, a couple of things that were, when you say, well, you know, what, what was in the water in that household? Well, right. I can tell you, um, watching my father study like a year plus in advance for a test, he ended up working his way um, working his way up the Chicago Fire Department. And, you know, from, from an entry level position, but I, I mean, I grew up watching someone obviously working harder than most. There's that. Um, growing up where uh, our, our, our mother in particular is just oozing with creativity uh, as a dancer, visual artist, singer. Um, that paired with the fact that we were never told that it was difficult. It was never, you can't do that because it's difficult. It's if you want to do that, then you need to really do it well, like give it your all. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all really good, uh, good combinations. But then <laughs> there's so many other things, like for instance, uh, early on, we were involved in the, the, uh, the Merit School of Music, which was a tuition-free program for us. You know, where um, even you didn't you didn't have to have any money to to take private lessons, ensemble classes, ear training classes. You know, this is this is rare because even at that point, um, 
um, music was being severely cut from the schools. I was also very fortunate, even in elementary school, to have a wonderful uh, band and choir teacher, um, Barry Elmore, who's still a very close part of our family, extended member of our family, who I would credit to uh, being one of the main reasons why this school and, you know, one of the poorest areas of Chicago having tremendous students. I went back, I don't know, five years ago or so. These kids are brilliant and bright. And even though he's retired, I believe he set a standard for the teachers to come after him of how, how to mentor. Um, and so there was that. I also had teachers who knew when to pass me on to the next teacher. So I had teachers who were selfish. That's, I'm telling you that is rare. Teachers are possessive. It's you know, so all amazing, of these things. It's amazing that, that regardless of the economic background, if opportunity is presented, you're going to find you're going to find young people with the capacity to, to, to just blossom. So if I may, yeah, add on to that. This is the thing. There's a lot of talk of diversity these days. There's a lot of talk of, of racism these days. And look at this. We've got 50-50 representation right now. I just want to point that out there. Yes. Um, I'm grateful for that. <laughs> and this is the prime example of like, of, of the interesting conversations that could and should be happening around the world. <laughs> um, but in a way, it's, it doesn't really, it's not, doesn't seem to me to be very good business practice to, um, to eliminate opportunities uh, to find excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it is quite possible that I am the oldest, but if I wasn't granted the opportunity and therefore um, was unable to present, to be an example of what my brother could be when he was, you know, four, four years behind, um, the world would have missed out on really, I mean, one of the great clarinetists of the world. Right. So, so we, we need to, like, we need to interject and then we need to get back to how you got a flute stuck to your face. So your brother, Anthony McGill, is the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic. Yes, he's the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic. There was a point where he was just a black kid in the south side of Chicago. The, the same south side of Chicago that you see in the news all of the time. You know, right. all he needed was an opportunity. Music, here's a clarinet. And, and I just want to point out that that he just he was just awarded the Avery Fisher Prize, mm -hmm. both for his artistic work and for his social activism, right? Yes, yes. This this prize was was uh, given to him unofficially uh, earlier this year, maybe around even January. He was told of this of this award. Um, so the work, the social justice work that um, he's being acknowledged for, the quality of playing, the, 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 the musical uh, contributions that he's being acknowledged for, I just think this is a very important point, were acknowledged prior to this summer. Yeah, before. Prior to the, George the, Floyd. Right. So, you know, really hats off to to uh, the Davy Fisher, the committee, for recognizing, you know, so his, his brilliance. And he also, he also performed at Obama's inaugural. Uh, first, his first inauguration, yes. So Google, you folks out there, Google Anthony McGill, and because we're, we need to get back to your fine face here and how up to, how'd you get your first flute? When my parents were dating, I believe maybe my father was, they were around 19 or so. Uh, they would have parties and they would have jam sessions at these parties. My father would play a wooden African flute. My uncle would play bongos. My mother would sing just really just for fun. 
uh, my my mother prior to the marrying uh, bought my father a used a used metal instrument metal flute and that was the instrument that I found collecting dust in the in a in the closet so this is what I mean as a variety of happy circumstances um, you know a gift that a girlfriend gave her boyfriend would have, have such a, a tremendous impact on someone's life who doesn't exist yet. This, the world is funny. This is all, this is, I mean, this is, it's such a smile inducing story. No. So take us through it then. So you, you obviously display talent and, and. So. Well, I displayed interests. Yeah, well, that's, that's. It started there. 90% of the, right? <laughs> I displayed uh, uh, interests and it was interesting to actually hear my parents talk about their perspective of our trajectory uh, in that, you know, they really didn't have a, a lot of money, but they, they promised themselves that they would give their last penny to help us pursue what we wanted to pursue, as long as we were serious about it and as long as it was positive. You know, so um, yeah, they were willing to to make sacrifices for sure. They were willing to do the work necessary to find um, opportunities for us that could help out financially. You know, scholarship opportunities. Um, but you know, we were definitely very fortunate growing up to to be in that context of positivity and unconditional support, unconditional love. That said, it still doesn't take away from the fact that even if we didn't have that, we would still be capable of becoming what we became if there was opportunity. People, not everyone is fortunate enough to be born in a household with that kind of um, vision, that kind of determination to see past while we are having a hard time <laughs> financially, but we will still give our last penny for our son to play the flute. Mm. That requires um, a commitment to the future, an investment in the future, which is, um, uh, you can even say is risk taking, you know? Um, so that said, I just really, well, I wish that kids were able to, there should be a multiple le um, levels in society that could provide that kind of opportunity. The most obvious one is school, you know? And if I can just say something really quickly, since this is all connected, is that, you know, just, this is absolutely connected to my life and to the life that, um, that exists for me now, but couldn't have in another universe, is that the, one of the most amazing things for me is that you go to a public school in the south side of Chicago. Then you go to a public school in the north side of Chicago, public schools. And we are talking about different universes, like just simply how the schools are funded. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's built into the system that this, it isn't fair. And when I said that it's not very good business practice is that if I am running a business, I want excellence, period for the bottom line, you know, I want excellence. And when, when you are not in support of a system, and I mean this in a very broad sense, a system that, that can create excellence across the board, that knows how to recognize excellence across the board, um, then you are actually missing out on the best here and the best with this, you're missing out on that. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's, um, we're going to run out of time. And I, so there, there has to be part two. We're, we're going to come back. Well, we're going to come back because, because you're also, 
you've given me more videos and you give me you, you play with michael McHale, who's played with the camarada so that was a nice little tie-in mm -hmm. and you've sent me a video uh, and you and michael and anthony have a trio together and you've sent me some video of that so we're going to come back and do that another time okay. so but we're going to have to pull it together here and we haven't even got through the full story <laughs> but to echo what you say i mean just so much as being so much wonder as as a as a as a as a population is just being left on the ground the seeds aren't germinating because there's no water being applied mm -hmm. and i've got my own life i'm i'm I've been lucky enough to, to work with Camerata Pacifica as a flute player and, and as the artistic director. And we look at you, now one of the foremost flute players in the world. And then you and I both uh, admire that other bearded Northern Irish flute player. Yeah, the other one, yes. And the same thing, he, he, was, he was even more working class Belfast mm -hmm. than the, than I was. And he got to start playing in a community band. Mm -hmm. And now, arguably, James Galway is probably, I, it's my contention, mm -hmm. he is the best flute player that's walked the planet. He redefined mm -hmm. what the instrument Definitely. does. Yeah. That. And he, he wouldn't have happened, in all probability, it couldn't have happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. Because it would have been like too expensive. I mean, your, your story is, I want to meet your parents. <laughs> your story is, I want to go to one of those parties in your house, man. That's just. Yeah. So we need to, we need to pick this up again. Sounds but good. We do need to listen to some music. So can you take three minutes and just talk a little bit about the Undine Sonata? Yeah, so um, you so eloquently uh, shared with all of us um, the, this, this story of, this, of, of, you know, love, betrayal, violence. Um, I, what I love about playing this piece is that you can find your, your own way of, of portraying that, you know, it's not just sweet. It's such a gorgeous work on its own, without the story. It's such a gorgeous work. But I find, I find it so haunting because of this, um, at times, just this sweetness, this, you know, gorgeous melodies. It's so infectious in, in the best sense. Um, but we, we know what it's about. Right. You know, I love playing it for that for that reasons. I actually would say that it's uh, it's de it's one of my uh, favorite pieces in the standard flute repertoire to play because of the gorgeous melodies um, paired with a really this heavy story. Ah, oh, yeah. And, and the thing is uh, that I neglected to mention at the start that Undim was still in love with her ex-husband right up until the end and so it's a tragedy and she kisses him and and he dies but you end you, it ends with this this ah uh, when he's buried order. she reappears as a spring at his grave and a little river ends up encircling the grave mm. so that in death she she still embraces him in yeah death. that's and then that's you can, I mean, the ending is just everything. So it's great if people can listen for that yeah. at, at the end. Yeah. It's a beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. So from March 9th, 2012, we have uh, Syrinx by Claude Debussy. From the beginning of July 2020, we have a, an amazing performance by Jessica Chu and Damara McGill of uh, the Undine Sonata from Rhine. Damari, man, thank you so much. And, and I look forward to when we can pick up this conversation again. It's just yeah. so much to talk to you. It's a real pleasure. A real pleasure speaking to you. Enjoy the music.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, look who it is. The one and the only back again, Mr. Nicholas. <laughs> Nick, that's, a, that's Hi, everyone. A, that's Hi. a very dark background there. That doesn't look like England to me. I Shall I lift you up? You know that song, I lift you up. Oops. And there's the pool. <laughs> What Greek island? I'm sorry, but I'm actually in well. Um, I'm on Crete right. with Piot, and um, we've managed to make a getaway. And it's just—I mean, we've just finished a very stressful time, and we've managed to find the most beautiful place, which was suggested by a friend of ours. And um, it really is kind of amazing. I mean, the weather—we have had a 5.9 earthquake. Just think of those numbers for a second. And a hurricane. <laughs> so but, the weather you, hasn't been perfect, but you know what it is. But you've gone there after um, this superbly successful event that you presented. And um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. And, and I've asked Nick and, and his, his, his staff and his board at the Leicester International Music Festival this is, they just did an online festival and the production, the, 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 the production, the concerts, the performances, the, is simply the best online presentation that I've seen. Barring, of course, Camera Out of Pacifica, but it-, it No, exactly. It is, we had high standards. <laughs> it, is, it is superb. And um, you, you're gonna share now, we're gonna share the, the first episode of the festival. Um, I'm going to put up a graphic you, yeah. here. Um, Google LIMF 2020 on YouTube. And yeah. you find how many programs, Nick? We had six programs, um, including a family concert and an education project, which has been a year long education project with Mark Simpson, the composer. And um, so we had four kind of, yeah, four evening concerts and two daytime concerts. And, and we, we put them on actually at exactly the time when our festival would have been from Thursday of last week until Sunday. And um, what's interesting is that exactly the same as you found with Camerata, that during the, during the week, the, the number of views increases. And I, I, I mean, this is the first time we've done this, the first time we've had to do this, the first time we've been faced with anything like this. We are a tiny organization run by incredibly intelligent people who are not paid to do so i mean none of my none of my board are paid i'm paid but they're not paid um and they do it for absolute love and so as a result not only have you got people who really care about it but people who have skills which they bring from other parts of their lives so our chair for instance is a retired head teacher um and he brings so much calm authority to it and he can sit in a meeting and he can just go, yeah, we're not doing that. Or yes, we're doing that. Let's move it on. <laughs> so he's brilliant. But it's, um, it's been an incredible learning curve for all of us. I mean, we hit March and um, Malcolm, who, who works very closely with Kevin and me um, and Marjorie on the board, he just said, there's no way, there's no way we're having people in a concert hall. And I said, what, really? Not by September? And he said, just it's never going to happen he was looking at all the signs and all my god was he right um and particularly because leicester is um our audience is comparatively elderly and also because the museum where we hold our concerts which is a stunning space simply won't allow gatherings there but leicester as a city has been under tighter lockdown than the rest of the uk it's it's actually a fascinating city it was the first city in Europe with, or one of the first cities in Europe with a white minority. So it has a mostly North and South Asian um, uh, majority. And as a result, it's, it's politically beautifully represented, um, educationally, uh, in terms of the city, in terms of the, the vibe, everything just feels so, so positive there. I mean, it's in a terrible state now. It is, but, but, you know, all we can do is say we festival, hope it gets better. Your festival, how long has it been going? How many years? Oh, about 25 years. I've right. done it for uh, had, 18 years. You've had um, 
you've had camerata musicians there. Richard and Annie have both played at it, right? So, yeah, yeah, and 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 actually Kristen Lee as well, and nice. um, and and in fact, you know, the the thing is, the thing that's a bit frustrating is that if we had more money, I could create more opportunities, and um, but we just don't. So it's very hard to grow it, but. Keeping it healthy right now, to me, seems the only important thing. Well, what, what you've done is amazing. And so I watched this first. I've been watching the other streams at my own time, like you suggest, but I watched the first one live. And so let's, let's introduce this program because um, I thought the first piece was super. And what a flute player. And yeah. Jim, <laughs> the, the second collection that you've put together just is heart stopping so um thank you introduce us what are we about to hear okay so the idea of a schubertiada is is an old idea and it's as if you are in schubert's drawing room um and you're hearing him bring pieces to life and so what we did was we invited our composer and association eleanor alberger who was born in jamaica married to a British man, lives in, in the UK. She's 70 years old. She's just one of the best composers I've come across for years. She's, a, for me, a total revelation. And her music in all the concerts added this ama um, beautiful rhythmic and life lively aspect to it, where actually much of the music, apart from that, is quite calm and reflective. And I found myself recently being terribly drawn to not sad music, but music that just enables me just to calm and settle myself. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a crazy world out there. It's even crazier over there than it is over here, perhaps. Um, I don't know. But ha having Eleanor be kind of like the guest in Schubert's Lounge, which I thought was beautiful. So what we did was... Um, during the Schubert section, which is four Schubert songs played on instruments with no words. I mean, the words are so well known in a way that you can, you can remember them or look them up yourself. Um, but we, we all sat on the stage and listened to each other. So you can see us taking part in a way with the, with the event as if we're in, in one person's living room. I mean, I have to say that during the filming of it, which was all six concerts, apart from the education, most of the education project, project, were filmed on one evening. They were all done in single takes. They were all done with the most incredible intensity and, and love. And somehow when you're watching, I think you get the feeling that we were all taking part in something that we knew was special. I because certainly, it's just I certainly, being there certainly, on stage, you know. I certainly received that across across the screen. So, so introduce us then. So, first piece, and then followed by the four songs, and we will listen. Okay. The, the first piece is called Animal Banter, Eleanor Alberger. It's for flute, cello, piano. That's Dan Shaw, Laura van der Hayden, and Anna Tilbrook. And then you'll hear two pianists, and in between each pianist's performance, the piano was sterilized. <laughs> um, so there was a tiny break, but we kept it sort of flowing. And the first one you hear is um, with a violin and piano, which is Di Forella, the trout. And then you hear Zeimige Grust, Zeimige Kust, which is on cello with Laura van der Hayden. And then you hear Auf den Strom from Winterreise with, with Tim Riddart playing the viola, Total Star. And then the last song is, is the one I, I play, which is um, Nacht und Träume. And it, it talks about the way that night means something to us, that it enfolds us in its embrace. And, and when the morning comes, we sort of cry out asking for it to come back. Well... Across the Atlantic Ocean, across seven thousand miles, Nick, you have you and your 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 friends and your musicians at, at at the Leicester Festival. This is a real gift, and so to all of our camarada friends, it's uh, 
you you will do your you, you'll enjoy today's performance and then just go and find the rest of these shows because they are such such treasures and, and, and worth listening to thank you so much thank you it's a joy thank you so much adrian and here we have nick's crew with music by eleanor alberga and schubert see you next week
Thank you.
Thank you. 